Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to our panel. My name is Brendan Davis. I'd like to welcome everyone today to our panel conversation discussing India's conversion into modernism. I'm Brendan Davis, as I mentioned. I am a filmmaker, and I also do East-West consulting. I've had a focus on China. I'm from Los Angeles. Today, I am very pleased to be joined by experts from a wide range of issues and sectors as far as what they care about, what they're passionate about, what their specialties are, ranging from public health, social transformation, economics, business, tech, entrepreneurship, and much more. I'm going to first start by reminding everyone what the panel is, and I'll introduce the panelists, and we'll go from there. So the panel is fueling India's march into modernism. It was conversion, now we're marching. India's conversion into modernism calls for a co-option of governance, science, and social welfare into the cosmology of its traditions. The questions we'll be looking at today, first of all, will the COVID-related shifts in the common Indian way of life accelerate this transformation that's already underway? What is the best way to guide India into innovation moving forward? And lastly, what new national legislation and practices might be required to facilitate this? I'm joined today by five very distinguished guests. I have Manira Alva, the Vice President of Vital Voices USA. Please wave Manira because I don't think our names are all on the screen. I'm Ravi Kumar Jain, who is the Director of the Symbiosis Institute of Business Management at, Habir at Hyderabad in India. Pardon my pronunciations. Um, Mr. Vince Coley, a mentor at 500 Startups in the USA. He's my neighbor up north in the Silicon Valley. Um, Rashan Shankar, Urban Governance Advisor to the Government in Delhi, India. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Naresh Trahan, the founder of Medanta India. Now, the way this format's going to work, this is as much as I'm planning to talk once we get started here. I'm going to go to each of our panelists in turn and ask them to do a little bit more of an introduction of themselves, like about a 30-second brief bio. Then they're going to give us some introductory thoughts on their overall vantage point on this topic of today. They're going to take about two minutes apiece and let us know where they're sort of coming from to get us started, and then we're going to get into the conversation. So without further ado, I will start with Dr. Naresh Trahant. Doctor? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because we are all over the world. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be on this distinguished panel. Uh, the basic facts that we are facing right now, in addition to my, my, my uh, introduction, I graduated from medical school in India, was in the U.S. for 18 years, trained at NYU, practiced at NYU in New York, and then returned to build a heart institute first in India, and then now Medanta, which is a 1,500-bed super, super specialty hospital, much like the Cleveland's and the Mayo's of the East. So now, as you all are suffering the same uh, situation around the world, we've all been so concerned about where two things. One, what it's doing to us today, health-wise, economically, and where we are going as we come out of it. So in India, few things happened which COVID-19 brought into focus. One, immediately we realized that we do not have a healthcare infrastructure in India which can support many, many people getting sick and many people requiring ventilators. So the lockdown helped. The Indian innovation came to work, it came to very handy, I would say, because very quickly, the things that we needed for COVID were manufactured in India, like the PPEs, the ventilators, the beds, and all the supplies have then in those two months, they were all on ground. So now you can say India is COVID ready as the numbers are going up. So it has compressed many thoughts right now. One, we realize that we have been underspending on healthcare. We need to double it, quadruple it to build the full stack from the ground level where we need to take care of the basic amenities for our people like the hygiene, primary health, all that stuff and built up to the super specialty hospitals that we have fair number of in India. So we need to build the ground and the middle level so that we can serve our population in a much better way as we move forward. This we have been we have been conscious of it, but not enough was invested. 
Second thing that has happened is we are very encouraged by the Indian innovators, industry coming together. And, you know, over a period of four weeks, they, they made one of the one of the better ventilators in the world at a cost of mm -hmm. one and a half thousand to two thousand dollars. Now, that is compared to the cost of ventilators available around the world. So my point is, one, we are ready to, to revamp our healthcare system. The government and private uh, uh, operators have come together very closely in this challenge. This hopefully will last. And more importantly, what we do for India today is applicable to 4 billion people on this earth. Because you take Africa, CSI, uh, CSI countries, uh, Southeast Asia, all of them are suffering from the same burden of healthcare cost and lack of proper facilities. So I think this is an opportunity for the for all of us to come together, put our ideas together, and healthcare would be different five years from now. That's my dream, and I think that the government and the population is ready for that. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you so much. I will go to Ravi next, if you could give us a short introduction and uh, sort of your take on this for today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon, and uh, greetings of the day, all the esteemed panelists. Uh, this is my first uh, Horasis address, so uh, I, uh, I'm privileged to be part of this uh, uh, esteemed panel and a very diverse panel, both uh, in terms of thought uh, process as well as uh, uh, geographical diversity. Uh, if I have to introduce myself, I mean, in simple in one line, uh, I am a, a Baniya with a penchant for uh, academics. And I found my love in academics uh, two decades ago, and I'm still romancing with it and enjoying the same. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, with, with 20 years into academics and uh, grappling with uh, uh, management research, family business, and uh, 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 building institutions, uh, Symbiosis Hyderabad campus is my second assignment to build a greenfield project. I'm greenfield management institution uh, in India. I mean, Hyderabad, you know, is a is a, a center of uh, you know uh, Indian IT now, uh, much uh, greater in terms of IT export even ahead of Bangalore. Now, with that, uh, with today's topic on uh, India's uh, you know how do we fuel India's march into modernity? So uh, I, I would possibly take a slightly bigger canvas in uh, uh, articulating my ideas here uh, in this context, uh, not just with COVID uh, as the context, but in general, uh, where we have come from and where we are heading to. So uh, I would I would I would speak in three parts. And first is understanding India. Now, how do we understand India? India as a country, India as a confluence of cultures and all. If you look at India, it, 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 is a, it is a piece of geography rich with legacy, but forgotten history. And uh, this, this history which is forgotten is well encapsulated in tradition, culture, literature, and so on. Very, very rich. Second uh, important characteristics of India is it's a confluence of fourth, second, and third worlds. When I say that, I mean... We have on one end uh, people engaged in the cutting edge research and you know reaching out to moon and Mars and so on, extraterrestrial uh, kind of a uh, intraterrestrial kind of a research and travel. And on the other end, we are uh, having people grappling with their basic necessities and eternal struggle uh, for I would call it as roti, kapra, and makan. Uh, that is for you know uh, food, clothing, and shelter. Uh, and this is perhaps because of the strong hangover we had for over 1,000 years of invasions and foreign rules, which greatly reflected in its educational system, which is deeply distorted in producing, I would in my terms would call as producing workforce or clerks, doing rudimentary stuff and never encouraged to get into innovation. And that's where we are missing very little on innovation in the last 70 years of post-independent India. Uh, then another important characteristics of India is uh, a massive middle class with a high aspiration. We call it as aspirational young India and so on. That's possibly a ray of hope in the so-called demographic dividend, always, I mean, overplayed many a times. But it is plagued with uh, several inequalities in terms of infra, education, healthcare, and so on and so forth. I'm sure my, some of the points will be covered uh, by the esteemed panelists, my friends on the uh, panel. 
so if i have to in your language uh, brandon uh, you are a filmmaker uh, <coughs> your uh, language if i have to put india uh, visualize as a, a young aspirational youth uh, lost in the new world forgot his rich past and grappling to get liberated and uh, that liberation the key for such liberation is education now then comes the second idea I'll take a no, minute. And, and, and we, we, we need to wrap this up in about 30 seconds so I can get everybody through. Yeah. So please so, summarize. Uh, I would say so then the third part, I'll leave it uh, for the further discussion. Uh, but one part I want to uh, share here is what is the idea of modernism? Any society or a country is uh, called modern if they have three important aspects, as per my understanding. One is it should be progressive in terms of systems, traditions, practices, often fueled by technology and innovation. Two, it should be inclusive in terms of ethics, governance, and welfare orientation with well-being of all. We call it in Indian I mean, uh, verse as Sarve Jana Sukhino Bhavantu. And third important is sustainability, where we talk about environment and nature, a coexistence, harmonious existence with nature. And again, in that they call it as uh, a lifestyle and consumption pattern, which reflects that. Uh, uh, often in management uh, literature and management education, we have been teaching for a long, long time about uh, people bottom line called people, planet, uh, and profits. Our profit, people, and planet. And now I want to reverse it as a planet first, people next, and profit next. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much, and that's all excellent. And I wish we had three hours instead of 45, or I would just shut up completely. But uh, speaking of people and a person who thinks about people specifically uh, in her very specific way, uh, Manira, would you please uh, grace us with an introduction and tell us your your position on today's uh, conversation? Uh, I think I am on this panel to represent the 675-odd million women of India. I know I'm currently based in D.C. as the vice president in Vital Voices, overseeing a program for women's political participation globally, increasing it, working with women political leaders. But between 2012 and 2015, served on the prime minister's high level committee on the status of women, which was the period of time when we really did a deep dive into what the conditions are and what really needs to be done. Unlike Dr. Trehan, I did it in reverse. I came to the U.S. only four years ago uh, to get a graduate degree and stayed on uh, on this particular assignment because I found it fascinating to be able to work with women politicians from across the world. So um, I speak as an Indian woman because that's what I am. Uh, we are 48 odd percent of the population. We are not a homogeneous group. We reflect the pluralistic society that India presents across religion, region, caste, class, ethnicity, and whatever it is that you have. But it is a paradoxical, it is a paradoxical situation for women in India. The sociocultural landscape for women is a complete mixture of the new and the old. And while we do have institutions which we claim are modern, be it our executive, our legislature, our judiciary, in the public space and the family in the personal space. The fact is that the foundation is based on a very strict patriarchal system. And I think it is therein that the challenges lie. And if India is to march into the modernism that we are talking about across healthcare and academia and citizenship, then those 65, 675 million women have to play a role. Very well said. Thank you for that. Uh, Roshan, sir, go to you next. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks to all the panelists. Hey, great points made till now. Uh, my name is Roshan, uh, and I'm based out of New Delhi. Uh, in the academic part of my career, I was a computer scientist, uh, and I was working on problems in algorithmic game theory. Uh, but about five or six years ago, um, I, I think I pivoted to working on uh, issues of public problem solving. Um, I moved back to India from Stanford, uh, helped uh, in the uh, political manifesto of a new political party of, uh, that was being formed in Delhi. Uh, we ended up forming a government, uh, I mean, uh, uh, which is pretty rare for new political parties to be able to do so. And I've served uh, as my first job uh, for five years inside city government. Um, so I think I, I bring a vantage point of a, of a few different spaces. One is being able to look 
being able to look at things from inside the state, but hopefully with a, a, a different view or at least a refreshing view of how things, how bad things are and how they could improve. Uh, the second is, I think, uh, just from, uh, when I, from when I've been very young, I, I think the constitution uh, written by a host of intellectuals and uh, people who thought about India and Indians deeply uh, uh, has, been, has been sort of an inspiration. And one of the... I mean, sort of important issues that it brings up is the fundamental duties, which I which we spoke about in our pre-chat as well. But um, and in those fundamental duties, I felt that two critical sort of pieces have sort of gone really missing across uh, state, market, and society. So there are some that the state seems to emphasize a lot more on. Uh, the market ends up emphasizing a few others. But I think broadly, two that have sort of missed everyone's vote is being able to protect and improve the natural environment, uh, which is uh, everything from lakes, rivers, wildlife, uh, and having compassion for living creatures, which sort of extends out, out of our own species as well. Uh, and the second has been to develop a scientific temper, uh, the spirit of inquiry and reform and, and humanism, if I'm not mistaken. And I think just having this broader, more universal and global view is something that's gone really missing in the last few years, um, uh, last few decades, I'd say. Um, how do I see COVID uh, really changing things in India? Um, I think what has really happened is, especially with the lockdown of us being uh, undergoing, I think the most brutal and most uh, strict lockdown across the world, is people actually sat down at home for 60 days and they actually looked at the society around them for a change. I think there's a lot of things that people hadn't been looking at. Uh, now, a lot of people do end up seeing the corruption, the criminalism, the casteism, uh, the conflict that exists in our society. But there are a lot of other trends that have sort of gotten India in the wrong direction. I mean, some of them, at least for me, we're, we're, central we're going people. to get into the topic. We're, I'm going to ask the question yes. to get into the details. Right. Sorry, to, sorry to cut you shorter. I just I, I want to save that for the specific question. Is that okay? I apologize. Absolutely. You're making yeah. wonderful points, and so I feel guilty every time I jump in. And last but not least, Vince, please give us a little introduction of yourself and then again, your your overall take, and then we're going to get into that exact question. All right. Uh, thank you, brother. I want to first uh, welcome Horace's team and their due diligence and their whole cooperation to bring this virtual event live. It feels like really connected. Then I want to say thank you, Brendan. He has been really helpful in the last few days to work with us. And thank of course, much. our esteemed panelists on diversity. So my name is Vince Coley. I'm from Silicon Valley Venture Capital Investor, a 6X tech entrepreneur, serial business builder, tech visionary, inventor, public speaker, and author for almost two decades. Uh, I'm At the moment, I'm a very active high uh, and super angel investor in Silicon Valley and a global venture mentor maker with enterprise blockchain and cloud, cloud innovation with social enterprise innovation for purposeful community. So that's my whole purpose. Look for next generation of inventors and innovators. I have expertise in innovative scalable models, open systems, scalable, scalable technology for social innovation and data storytelling. I'm also um, a venture mentor maker in Silicon Valley for global startups and scale up ecosystem. SAP recognized and awarded this SAP Mentor Award and pioneered first ever corporate mentorship award at a prestigious recognition in Palo Alto, Silicon Valley. With all this, what I've done is I've actually got associated with high end incubators and accelerators like Y Combinator, 500 Startups, Founders Institute, and on the corporate innovation side is Google and Samsung. So I developed this program, which now I call it a seven second pitch. It's actually a thinking which you have to put a constraint as a founder to give an investor a seven second pitch. Uh, it, it has become very popular now. It, it is being used by Facebook, uh, Google executives. The reason I bring this up is the learning. So I was not born with this skill, but I got this skill by mentoring over 5,000 odd startups. And coming back to the topic of today, modernism, so I would summarize modernism in one word, and that word is mindset. Why we're thinking today, and COVID has actually accelerated, what I call is a forced pause. A forced pause is a pause where you start introspecting and being self-aware who you are, what you are. And I think that introspection has uh, made people thinking. Again, I feel 
the modernism is just a delta change in people's thinking. But what we want to accomplish today, we'll talk more during the panel. So thank you, Brandon. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for those wonderful introductions. And so since I so rudely jumped in, Roshan, I would ask you to please pick up and recontextualize what you were saying when I had to jump in, because the question that we're going to start is essentially, how is COVID accelerating or highlighting the issues that are that are in the mix right now in terms of what you're working on, specifically in terms of governance and operations of a society, those sorts of things? No, great. Uh, there's no worries at all. I think it's important for you to play the, the good cop and the bad cop at the same time. I, I don't mind. I think, I'm just being nice. <laughs> uh, so as I look at it, I think the I I'll, I think I'll maybe take an example to just walk you through what I think of uh, how how this could operationalize or how it's really looking on ground. I think uh, of yesterday we had a, a a partial solar eclipse, and over the last 60, 70 days, obviously Delhi has been facing the brunt of uh, COVID nineteen a lot more. And I saw that a lot of lot more people were staying indoors because of a solar eclipse uh, rather than staying indoors because of COVID or, or covering their face uh, as quickly as possible uh, by wearing face masks. And I think this the sort of the very fact that over time tradition and our, our maybe astrology and a host of different spheres told us don't go out during a solar eclipse. That's not a good thing. However, we weren't uh, really listening to scientific advice that was coming in from let's say epidemiologists or statisticians who said that uh, wearing a face mask works or uh, let's say uh, ensuring that you are socially distant with people when you're in public spaces is useful. Uh, I think the very fact that we do have certain traditions that sort of overarchingly take over our minds ends up sort of reflecting in our public choices as well. So what I do think COVID has done is it sort of brought a clash between some of the traditions and the things that we've seen in the past as this is how things are, uh, to being able to look at things afresh and see things as they are right now. So I don't think, as Dr. Trehan said, for example, I don't think it's really perturbed anyone till now that we haven't invested in public health care at all as a nation. But I think now that we're hit with it, we're finally at a space saying, how do we do this as quickly as possible? So I think just having a glaring focus on the truth is, has been very refreshing. And at least it's also brought a lot more players, not just from the state, but also from market, society and media together to work on the same problem. Uh, necessarily, I do not think that, uh, well, there are certain, obviously, legislations and practices that need to change. I mean, we have a Indian penal code that was uh, written uh, during the British Raj. So, for example, a police, uh, the Epidemic Diseases Act, which is an act which sort of governs a lot of things around COVID, was actually written in the 1890s uh, at a time when mal the cure for malaria wasn't even found. So there is a necessity to modernize a lot of these things, but I think it's a problem more of process rather than technology or, or, or even legislation. I think there needs to be a much more relentless focus that uh, we as Indians across all branches of government and non-governmental institutions have uh, to being able to look at truth from the first principles to being able to uh, evaluate things for ourselves. So even if the WHO was delayed by uh, 50 days to getting to the right advice on masks, uh, what your physicists tell you, what your biologists tell you, what your cardiologists tell you, uh, that should be sort of informing a lot more of the decisions that you're making on a day-to-day -day basis, whether as an individual or as the state. And I think just to close my comment on, on the COVID-related shift, I think what we have definitely seen uh, in India, which is uh, which is very, very true, is that we've sort of ignored a lot of things, which I was sort of con competing in my last statement. We sort of ignored centralization. We've ignored uh, a deep sense of cynicism and uh, a, a systemic malaise of cronyism across the board. I think that we, we sort of had... We've been consuming things very, I mean, if you, if you look at the Indian economy, uh, most of the economy runs by the consumption of the top 10%. Uh, so by a few days ago, we had a lot of uh, inter-border disputes with China and people were saying, don't use Chinese goods. But people have forgotten that for more than 80% of this country, uh, the, the fundamentals that Ravi pointed out, uh, food, clothing and shelter, a lot of that is currently still being built by the Chinese, either directly as goods or being uh, moved across the border, so it's not as if it's it's just the mobile phone or the or, or the heavy industry that China is supporting. It's also supporting a, a huge chunk of the Indian economy. So if we really do need to think of uh, what is the self-reliance, which is I think a theme that I've sort of 
it's heard across a host of panels of for, for, for us is, is that we have to think of an India which is doing and building for all Indians and not mm-hmm. just uh, for a very minuscule or micro proportion of that uh, sort of space. And I think even that is really uh, being brought to the forefront. So I think you've seen right. most businesses, most civil society organizations pivot around that idea. Excellent. Thank you. And I'll, and just for note, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this sign to mean we really need All to wrap right. it up because right. I, I need to get everybody in, but everybody doesn't have to answer every question in detail. So that was wonderful. Um, I see the shape of how this is heading because the right now situations, again, governance, cultural issues, obviously economics and things, technology would have a role in this, but I think Vince is going to come in heavier on the, on the, on the later part of this in terms of where do we go from here, I'm guessing. But uh, I'd like to start with the obvious, which is health. Uh, Dr. Trahan, could you weigh in on this? And then we'll kind of see who else wants okay, to contribute so if, in this thought. If, if I drill down on what I had done in my introduction. So we have, uh, like I said, underspend means we spend 4.5% of our GDP on health and that only 1% comes from the government. So that means that there is an imbalance in there, which first of all has been actually compressed now by the challenge of COVID that the government has reacted. The government has allocated money, 15,000 crores, 7,500 to fight COVID and then for the future. And I think that that is a very welcome thought process change because as said earlier by uh, by our co-panelists were, that education and health are the two very important pillars mm-hmm. in our society. One, and both of them need a lot of boosting. Question basically is, the world itself is suffering under the burden of healthcare cost. India has this major opportunity, as I mentioned tangentially earlier, to actually come up with those low-cost delivery models, which we can, I am convinced we can, where we can deliver the highest end of care at a reasonable cost. Now, the fact is, one thing I'll tell you, India needs to change in one way. We have been master copycats. Even I am a copycat. I went and trained in America, brought it back to India, and I may have done some many things from that, But the point is the fundamental ecosystem of building a nation has to be brought together in my field. As I said to you, there are encouraging signs that our innovators and industry came together very quickly to innovate things which we had never thought about. So COVID has actually stimulated our, you know, Prime Minister Modi has been saying make in India this and India that in India. But actually, they just stayed that way and people did not really take it to to themselves that, yes, we have an opportunity in India. So I think India will be different. We need to come, we we take it to the full length, starting from the wellness center, which will be for every five villages, there will be a wellness center. The wellness center will be the triage center for all disease. It will kick it up if people need secondary care, tertiary care or super tertiary care. That, that stack is actually, the, the elements are already there. There is a, there's a scheme in India, Swach India, Swast India, means clean India and, and healthy India. We need to actually compress them all under one vertical and we will see a different India as we move forward. Now, the fact remains, Tom Friedman, all of you are familiar with, said very, uh, the other day, he said, Today, this is a war between Mother Nature and Father Greed. Have we, and and you said earlier, this is a good time to actually look at who we are. What is our need? What, What kind of consumption do we have to make? Somebody wrote a very nice article on what would Gandhi do if he was here. It's worth reading. So... But what would Gandhi do if he was in this time in the in the middle of the COVID crisis? What, what do you think he so would there, do? Can, very, nice you... Elements, very nice elements that come out that look, his at his time, 75 years ago, he talked about, you know, self-contained India. Self-contained India at that time, maybe basic, a basic India. But these 75 years we have not used to transform self-contained India 
into modernism. But here is, we may, it may be a late start. We, I think we are 20 years behind other countries that jumped on the wagon earlier. But with our brains, which I believe there is plenty of it in India, our ability to, to actually innovate because we have been living by innovation. Our daily life is innovation. If we actually create the ecosystem around it, I think you will see a different India five to ten years from now, and we will find our place in the sun. Fantastic. And I want to briefly point out what's wonderful is so far each of you has sort of answered the whole prompt, which is, you know, what's you know, what's the state of things now? What needs to change? You're sort of answering that a bit, which is good news because we have about 15 minutes. So I'm going to modify this is part of my job is we have to sort of modify the situation as we go. If the rest of you could take three or four minutes as well and sort of answer this question, they'll save us maybe a minute apiece to go around the room and get your closing thoughts. So each, so, so whoever would like to go next, please. Uh, and I uh, thank you, Connie, for your comment. Whoever would like to go next. Um, uh, yes. Please, sir. Right. Uh, in my opening comments, I did talk about the idea of uh, modernism and uh, the idea of India. And I, I mean, I would start uh, from where uh, Dr. Trihan has uh, closed. Uh, the idea of, I mean, uh, innovation in everyday life. And we, you know, very, um, in, a, in a very uh, nice way, the world has acknowledged it as Jugaad. And uh, they also promoted at Harvard University called, you know, Jugaad way of looking at things. Mm-hmm. Means uh, somehow get things done with whatever mm-hmm. you know, frugal means that you have. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, please understand, frugality is not out of uh, uh, the necessity of uh, lack of resources that India is suffering now for, uh, as I said, for the last uh, you know, uh, few uh, centuries. But when India was the richest in the world with you know, 17 to 20% of the GDP, in that, at, during those times also, frugality and conservatism was promoted as an as a idea of your, I mean, as a, as a core part of your life's time. What you consume, your consumption pattern, and so on. Now, as you rightly said, they, when we are fighting this, uh, the current COVID situation is more about uh, mother nature versus father greed, and so on. Now, in the context of India and the canvas that I have chosen to talk about as the broader canvas is, if we can take COVID or uh, this situation as a trigger to kind of to 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 fire, uh, you know, a new uh, booster for the for the country where we reach that escape velocity to move into the next orbit. And that escape velocity can be fueled, I mean, can be given by or can be gained by only innovation. Now, where do you get innovation from? I mean, NFA has been talked about innovation and, you know, making in India, as he said uh, earlier, if, unless it is made part of your education system. Just give me, a, let me uh, take an example now. Uh, you know, this COVID situation, I mean, this, this uh, virtual conference is also an outcome of that. I mean, we are all speaking from different parts of the world. We could have actually uh, otherwise met in, Viet- uh, uh, I think, uh, Vietnam, right? Now we are meeting in a virtual world and fairly comfortable and a lot of participation all across all sessions. Now, the same quick adoption has, has happened in uh, the education system also. Now, my point of contention, rather, point of worry here is, we have changed the mode in response or in reaction to the COVID situation where we have we are teaching the same thing in a different mode. I mean, instead of a physical mode, in a virtual mode. Instead of a classroom, you are having a virtual classroom. But did it, are we thinking about changing the model itself? Now, what I am trying to bring onto the table here is, here is the time for us to go back to our roots, dig deep into what our history says about education system. I mean, now, there are a lot of folklores and a lot of stories, a lot of anecdotes, historical anecdotes where they said Indian libraries were burned for months together. Such was the kind of collection of literature in uh, you know, cities like Takshila and Nalanda and so on and so forth. Now, that knowledge is still encapsulated in traditional practices. Now, it, it is a time now for us to dig deep into our history to design our future, understand the past to create the future is what my uh, mantra would be. And we need to invoke the spirit of innovation, which is there culturally. As Dr. Trian said, it is there as a part of everyday life for us. Now, can we systematize it? One major challenge is all these scriptures and the literature which is rich in India. I mean, you talk about any subject from astrology to astronomy, from metallurgy to medicine, 
and so on and so forth. I mean, you will have every spectrum of uh, education or every aspect of education covered there. Uh, just give me a minute and 30, 30 seconds, I'll close my comments here. We need to, now it's time for us to look at these scriptures or look at this literature in more scientific manner as scientific documents and bring out the ideas and guidance which will help us in future research. And this has to be embedded in our education system. And another point I would add is to promote the language of Sanskrit. Now, Sanskrit, they say, I mean, now I see some Harvard studies talking about Sanskrit be, would be the future of uh, language of the future and so on, or language of the computers and so on, especially in the AI uh, um, uh, environment. It is time to revive that language and bring it to the mainstream and promote it at the large scale. Because if you understand the language, you will be able to encode what is there in the scripture. If you are able to encode what is there in the scripture, you will be better guided in designing your future, looking at the glorious path, and nothing can stop India from arriving at uh, that past glory again. Thank you so much. Uh, this is where I rest my comments. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to go to Manira next, and I see the way this, again, as we're shaping, this is, this is a dynamic situation, all of you watching. So you're enjoying this ride with us. We hope you're enjoying it. I'm enjoying it because we really are getting some great perspectives on this. Um, but since we have... 20% of the panel representing, uh, you know, uh, a huge majority of your population. I would love to invite Manir to speak on, especially the cultural aspects in terms of society and innovate. And then I will end up asking Vince to take us into the last part about innovation and, and such. But please, Manir, could you uh, pick this up? Uh, if you were to ask me what the COVID crisis has really shown us, as far as I'm concerned, it's two really important things. One is the fact that the leadership women have displayed in terms of being intuitive, in terms of being practical, in terms of being problem solving has really shown the way across the world, whether it's from New Zealand right down to Kerala and Shailaja teacher. And I think that has really blown this whole issue open about how we want to handle crisis how we are prepared to look at crisis and whether we're really willing to look at a point of view and a leadership that is just so different from the regular, the normal, the testosterone driven kind of, I know what's better for you rather than we can do this together. It's a problem that we have and we need to do it together. So that is my first big learning through this whole crisis, which we have been tracking. And the second thing is about technology. We, are hearing a lot about technology. But when it comes to India, we also have to be aware of the facts. I think it's time to acknowledge that technology by itself is not empowering. It must be interlinked with broader policy interventions uh, across social sectors, right? Which is why we have the reason that a 14-year-old girl in Kerala, a student, commits suicide because she can't attend an online class. And that is the reality of India. We're talking technology. We're talking access. What are women's digital rights? What is the access of women to technology in India today? Of mobile owners, what I have read and, and believe is that it's 43% men, 28% women. Only 17% of Indian women have connectivity. And wow. only 29% of Internet users are women. So I, I don't know what this whole discussion is about, you know, academic kind of explosion and it going virtual because to me we are living in in very different worlds simultaneously and as i said unless we are ready for everyone to take even if it's baby steps into modernism and the future we have to do it uh, ravi you're talking about bringing sanskrit back and you're talking about you know really giving it a push i'm saying what about basic education at the rural level, what about relooking at our syllabus? What is it that we are learning today? What is the revision of syllabus that we need to march into modernity? Are we looking at what it is that we are learning, right? So to me, it's, it's just different worlds being saddled. And the fact is that it is wonderful to say that uh, we are marching into modernism, but uh, we have gone through globalization, urbanization, modernization. They have led to irreversible change. There is no doubt about that. But for women, it has been positive. 
and it has been discriminatory there has been a backlash there has been pushback there has been wage discrimination the modification casualization of women's labor and the violence right no one is addressing the violence that women face and we are talking about marching into modernism so uh, i'm sorry but to me we have a lot of thinking to do and a lot of different thinking to do innovative thinking to do which is what i believe uh, we are really getting to hear from generation z as we call them right who is right. impatient with structures that are just in place to weigh us down thank you for that i apologize for, i think what we've realized so far is that we need to double the length of the sessions but this is a heck of a first effort we're not done yet vince please if i could ask you especially to focus from your angle manira makes wonderful points you know there's the there's the blue sky and then there's the on the ground and as rashan said as well right you know so the implementation practically of philosophical ideals you know yeah. where the rubber meets the road is the west the american expression but how do you what are some of your thoughts on this and we'll try to leave a minute for a round robin at the end if we can but. well i think this modernism word is a shift of thinking so if you look at shift of thinking something has to major epidemic or pandemic has to happen to we to shift to something new why we need that kind of shift of thinking if you look at supreme court over you know ruled lgbt rights at workplace 10 days ago in the us and said that was given in the life now going back to dr trihan like when we say cost we're all thinking about cost so i'll give you one personal example of my own family my fam my, da- my dad is a doctor and a surgeon so from the indian army at age 22 he was actually got to parliament house in x a parliament house in x building opposite to parliament house he had a very comfort job for 30 years but what he decided instead of fighting of the cost he volunteered his time to a regular hospital they re- really he has to go through a lot of mess to do a surgery so i personally feel that a one doctor can make a change on serving the humanity it's a mindset like i can do one surgery free of cost in one week now if we all step up all together i think it's a shift of thinking so in my personal view we need to unlearn what we have learned mm-hmm. and that's the only way we can do innovation because innovation requires experimentation and experimentation has failures and failure is a mindset the more we fail the more we grow and i think we need to incentivize this failure in this culture so i feel the more uh, more appropriate word would be how to majorly shift a culture mindset to a new era which can promote innovation promote the failures help people experiment instead of we waiting for a cost to go down what can we do as volunteers and we can step up and that's what i personally feel that india's conversation we need to elevate at a leadership level so i would give you three things which i personally believe can make the shift of conversation uh, and, and you need to do it in like 40 seconds sorry i'm looking at the first is I say, <laughs> and the second is we need human centric ceos and leadership and the third is scaling radical empathy and in empathy means we really need to understand where the other citizens are at this point and to take action we got to deeply be compassionate in terms of our communication our thought process and giving ability to people to scale up and remove the word failure from the indian society as to say i am learning each day thank you thank you all so much and i want to say that i want everyone to take 10 seconds when i shut up and give us your sign off It's probably just going to cut us off. I wish we had three hours. We don't. Thank you so much to this wonderful panel, Dr. Trahan. If everyone can take about ten seconds with maybe a closing thought, and thank you if it cuts us off. Does anyone have any closing thoughts uh, while we have? Uh... Yeah. So all is said is, it's a time to hit the reset button. Mm-hmm. Evaluate everything you have. India has a great future because we are the brains of IT. IT is the future. So everything has to be built on it so we have the platform it's up to us to reach there. Fantastic. Change the mindset and uh, from incremental thought process to move towards uh, not just leapfrogging but pole vaulting to the change. Great. Get to the next topic. Culture of experimentation and empathy. Thank you We- everyone. <laughs> We, yeah. we, we go, I don't know if anyone's Thank still go, 
let's let's all do a groupie. If everyone would please look in their camera, and uh, I will do the virtual groupie thing. And uh, here we go. And ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. Did we do that? All right. I guess you all do. You, you all take your own selfie, and then it'll make a nice one for us. <laughs> yeah, everybody take a selfie and hit OK, and then I guess it will assemble one for us. Do, do share. Brandon, do share uh, I, I, with your edits and uh, improvisations. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Well, and, and, and as you see, it's, you know, um, what, what do they say about... Uh, you know, man plans, God laughs. How's that go? I guess different cultures have a different version of that saying. And 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 I, and sincerely, thank you for for rolling with it because, um, uh, again, I, I was as I said, you know, as I said on the on the live portion of this, it was nice because everyone sort of took took a whole you know a, a whole. Uh, holistic approach and sort of, and sort of talked about, you know, here's the state of things. Here's maybe what's got to change. And here's some ideas about I do it. Everyone sort of wrap that up. So, uh, is, has everyone done the groupie thing? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Has everyone done the thing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed this session. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Yeah.